So welcome to Martial Arts One on One Podcast. We got the legendary Sifu Fernandez here, uh, one of the greats within Wing Chun and the martial arts. Thank you for coming on. You're very welcome, Remy. Good to be here, mate. I want to know. I want to know a little bit more about your uh, background. So, um, how did your martial arts path uh, begin? Oh, well, it uh, started a long time ago. Um, my family migrated to Australia in in the mid '60s, 1965. I was about six months old, and basically, we grew in a in a vi- in an environment that was you know, pretty highly. Um, there was a lot of prejudice and a lot of racism, basically, at that, that time. So. Uh, the Australians didn't seem to like the Italians or the Greeks or, you know, very much. <laughs> we had a lot of bullyism at school and it was, you know, so, you know, that was the main reason that my brother and I got into it. And so my brother being a lot older than me, he, he looked for a few Kung Fu schools and happened to fall, you know, go to the first school, which was uh, Wen Chun. And uh, we ended up um, basically going there. So the first teacher we had was uh, Jim Fung, Sifu Jim Fung, under the Sushil Tim lineage. And he went there first in 1971 and basically became my first teacher, my brother. And then in 1972, we, we, I started going officially. So I was, yeah, around six, seven years old when I started. Yeah. Yeah. But then from there, you know, we, we stayed there for many years and, uh, yeah, I moved on. Uh, I progressed to other different styles as well as, as I moved on. But mainly throughout my whole life, it's always been connected to Wing Chun. Awesome. All right. So that's cool. Um, I want to ask you, how has the martial arts uh, been a part of your life as a man, a bouncer, bodyguard? husband and in life in general well it's it's helped me in many ways um, basically because i've been doing it all part of my life uh, it helped me in my youth obviously to get gain confidence in myself and help me in sports in general and um, <clears throat> also actually did help me in my studies as well so um and plus, I cross-trained as well, so I got into to boxing, which helped me as well because I got into competitions as well. And uh, I went on an ex- a working experience in Italy where I trained with a team called Fernet Blanca, and we did, we did a fair few competitions there. Then the part about sort of moving, doing uh, worker security, um, yeah, I did over 25 years, but I've got around 26, 27 years of security. And I worked very many different levels of security on that. Either as a bouncer, a bouncer doorman, uh, riot control, where you do crowd control security or riots or people that go on strike, uh, in many different categories of work. And uh, also bodyguard service, so looking after people individually did that in Italy and overseas as well. Used to look after a pretty uh, crazy guy called David Wood. I don't know if you ever heard of him. But it's uh, more I I... billionaire. Yeah, yeah. You, you can find him on the net. Uh, and I was his teacher and his personal bodyguard. So I did that for a few years with, with him. Personally traveling over the States and in, in Costa Rica and wherever he paid me to go. So that was an interesting experience. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Overall, it te- teaches you, especially in security, to look at things with a different type of reality because the, the experience of combat is much more direct. Um, because I always like to experience uh, combat on different levels. Yeah, you know, I looked at competition. I've even trained with guys that do MMA, right? Um, because I, I like to look at all levels of combat and, you know, I, I throw myself in there. So I don't care if I lose, you know, I just want to experience the different types, the t- different types of combat reality. But for me, I wanted to see if Wing Chun would work at a close range. 
And it's always been effective for me. It's never failed me in that sense there. So being the security guard or doing bouncing or doing, you know, one-on-one type security or even one on more more people, Wing Chun's war was you know, without any problems. Or else I wouldn't be here teaching it today. You know? that's, that's for sure. <coughs> I can by first hand say that your Wing Chun is very effective because I've touched hands with you and uh, it was like trying to block lightning. It was, uh, you have a, you have amazing Wing Chun and uh, I was very lucky to um, get a few lessons from you uh, when we met in Russia. Would you say Wing Chun is a um, spiritual martial art or is that more on, or, or on an individual base or how important is it to, to train the martial arts, the mental and the physical simultaneously? Or do you, do you think that, that it leaves more for the individual himself or herself uh, to, to, to find that path? It, it is definitely an internal art as well. It, it definitely leads to spirituality. Uh, great Grandmaster Yip Man was one to teach the gentle side of Wing Chun and, and more an internal approach. And um, even his teachings sort of point the finger towards an internal spiritual approach. I mean, you've got to also understand that Wing Chun embraces, you know, three types of philosophy, three types of philosophies, which is your Taoism, uh, Confucianism, and Buddhism, right? So they're belief systems that encompasses the mentality of Wing Chun and uh, it, it gets trained into your body and in your mindset. So many times when I'm trying to teach a Westerner, I say, you sort of got to think a bit like, you know, Chinese to understand this art, you know, or else, you know, you can't force your way to do this art. You've got to do it with a much softer approach, a Taoistic approach. And everybody says, oh, what are you talking about? You know, and you bring them into the mentality of the Oriental way. And, you know, still for the Westerner, uh, it's hard. And, you know, I was um, probably uh, the biggest proof for these people because I used to be really, really strong, especially when I was doing security work. I was reasonably soft and very flexible. And, um, but biggest shock ha happened when I lost about 22 kilos. And, uh, and I was still shifting people around that was about 110, 120 kilos. And that sort of like freaked them out. They said, well, how is he doing that? <laughs> right, so that became more impressive, you know, to see somebody who weighs 80 kilos and still 104 kilos to be able to do that. So, you know, because I was able to still do it. I was able to do it at 104, but I kept saying to them, I'm, I'm not using the strength. And they said, yeah, sure, look at you. I'm like, well, okay. But it's not that I wanted to lose a, a, that, that 22, 23 kilos to prove a point. I just started, decided to do it because I'm going towards 60. And uh, yeah, I know I look incredibly young, but I'm going towards 60. But So I just want to redo my physique and be more toned and be work different types of uh, avenues to produce strength. You know, or as we call it, inner strength. So yeah, I, the, the answer is yes, definitely. And, um, but if you ask me, I probably looked into it more later in life than earlier because, probably because of my arrogance, because I was definitely more into fighting than looking into the internal side or the spiritual side. So it's probably been more in the last 18 years that I've been researching uh, the internal aspect. Because, you know, when you're young and, you know, especially with the world of Wing Chun, um, we get so many people speaking bad about Wing Chun, that they can't fight and stuff like that. In the north of Italy, you know, I'm a fairly renowned bouncer. There's not many people who say, I can't fight. Uh, you just need to ask around. Everyone knows me. So, you know, no one's going to bullshit me. I believe that. <laughs> um, you know, and, I, and I worked in the bouncing industry, you know, with all levels of people, you know, very big guys, uh, work with people who does MMA, you know, does Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and stuff like that. 
and it's a different ball game when you're working in that type of environment. You know what I'm saying? And you know, and, and biggest respect for these guys because they they're really tough people. But just the way I train my guys for that environment is completely different to maybe the way normal sparring conditions would be done for for the ring. I just train them completely differently. Yeah. Awesome. In, in, you, you know it yourself. In a, in a club, you know, when all hell breaks loose, it's just complete chaos. So that's that's how I train people, you know, chaos. You know? Yeah. Never a straight formula, no. How do you generate power? It's, um, well, from the ground up. From the ground up, from vertically. Does that make sense? No. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes and uh, I through the spine and it's almost very similar to the Mike Tyson uppercut. You know, everybody says elbow force, but elbow power is basically is one of the last things that generates the power. It's got to come from the body, right? Generates through the legs, through the hip, you know in a little square box i can't really demonstrate it that well but um so i could even maybe send you the links to to share i'll, I'll send, send you a link that maybe you can share on this channel of, of the video mm -hmm. that it properly but the energy comes up vertically all right travels through the spine and travels always upwards you're never pressing out horizontally or else you're going to lose power the punch does go out horizontally, but the power's coming up vertically. So the power that comes up vertically is actually mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and That's where we get our power from. It comes up from the ground. That's why they call it spring power. Got you. Understood. But one of the reasons why they call it spring power, the other reason is because we absorb the power of the enemy as well. That's a spring reaction, which also makes us power up our next our next technique. So I can power up the power that you give me, which charges my next my next technique. Mm. It can derive from a bong sao, can derive from a tan sao, which powers up my next technique, down my spine, back down to the ground, then bang, I drive it back up vertically to to my enemy. But I will. I'll send you a link. Oh. But I think a forty-minute video that explains it all. Of how would you like that? Well, I would like to watch that. Um, I used to watch uh, the Fight Quest show uh, with these two Americans going around the world and training different martial arts. And uh, I remember uh, hearing uh, Jimmy from the show the explaining episode. that. So, he was initially uh, supposed Chun to fight a white buff Wing Chun guy on the roof of Hong Kong. But for some reason, the producers changed the guy for the show. And I think he was referring to you. He actually talked about it on, on, on the episode. He, he has... I didn't know that. No, he has a podcast where he's uh, talking about the different episodes. Uh, and. It, and on a Wing Chun episode, he he, uh, he talks about that um, situation and referring to you, uh, that he was supposed to fight you. I, but I, yeah, I don't know I, why. The, I think, I, I, think I, I watched that episode. I, I, I watched part of it anyway. Yeah, no, the, like, yeah, my my side of the story, which because I was there. Look, it's really strange because put a bolt on it. When I arrived, um, the director looks at me and goes, you're not Chinese. Uh, <laughs> I said, fuck, what the fuck? I swear on this channel. I said, anyway, he said, what the fuck do you want from me? You know, it's like, Grandma Salong team, you know, it really hassled me to go at really short notice. I think I had less than 40 hours to prepare for, for this fight. Like I knew nothing about it. I didn't know this fight quiz program existed. I was too busy working and training. And um, 
And so, yeah, I, I was pretty big in that period of time. I was bloody 104 kilos and I was really, really full out with work, security work most nights of the week and training during the day and teaching as well. So I was flat out. And um, he says, no, you got to come, you got to come. Because it was a period I was selected to go and do private lessons with him, you know. And I said, shit, you, you really couldn't find anybody because the guy that was supposed to fight, um, sadly has passed away. Uh, he was he was Italian in the first place. He had a school in, in, um, in Japan. And, uh, you know, yeah, like I said, sadly he's passed away. His name, his name was Daniel. And so this crap about, you know, you're not being Chinese is, I can't work it out because the original guy was, was, was um, Italian. And then he had broken his foot. That's why he couldn't attend the fight. So anyway, what I did was, you know, I said, send me a video of this guy. And I thought, shit, he's a good, he's a good ground fighter. And I thought, funny, I said, well, my ground game wasn't really up to scratch, right? And I said, look, if he stands up and fights for me, you know, I'm full, I'm, I'm, I'll go for it. I said, punches, knees, elbows, as long as we can do that, kicks, I'm for it. But uh, for the ground, um, I don't feel too confident with this, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm honest, you know, I'll say where my strong points are, but I didn't feel that confident. He goes, no, 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 you got to go to the ground and all this. And I said, look, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to come. I'm going to look stupid if I'm not good at something and you're only giving me 40 hours notice. And he goes, all right. So I said, okay, bugger it. And I called my friend who was ranked number three in the uh, FIG Figma, FIG MMA um, world titles, right? And he's a beast. He's honestly, he's an animal, right? We worked security together for years, right? His name's Antonio Saracino. You can check out his stats. And I said, Tony, look, help me out, man. <laughs> Let's try a few hours together. And I said, if I can just resist against you uh, for at least three minutes, I'm happy, right? Anyway, he was throwing me around my personal cage that I'd built out in the country. He was throwing me around like a ping pong ball. Right? <laughs> oh, fuck. I said, what am I going to do, man? And he goes, look, if I were you, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't go to the ground, just fight him. And I said, that's what I'm telling my teacher. He says, well, don't fucking go. He goes, let me go. <laughs> and I said, no, man, he wants a Wing Chun guy there. He goes, oh, my God, I can do it. No, I said, oh, i got to go. And he goes, no, just uh, stand your ground. Don't go, and he said, just say you're not going to go to the ground, and that's it. That's it. So I stood my ground, and uh, they said, okay, if he th if he throws you to the ground, you simply get up. That's what we said on the contract. I got it in writing, and uh, you know, so we sorted that out. Yeah, you know, all everything was solved. All right. So I fly there, and within the 36 hours, I got there. Within 36 hours, I got to Hong Kong, and uh, they paid for the flight and everything. Hotel got there. Everyone's applauding me, or the Hong Kong crew. Hey, you're right, you're right. You know, you know go then. The director says, "You're not Chinese." I said, oh, no, I, I worked that much out. And, and I, I was just so angry. I was so angry. And I said to Jimmy, I said, "Man, I said, let's spar. Let's do something. Let's make a show. I mean, let's do something." They didn't even want to know about it. Not even a spar. That's what really happened. Now. Jimmy is saying something like, hey, I can I can take on big guys and stuff like that. You know, he, he probably didn't have enough, um, what do you call it, oxygen to take me, you know, or enough, you know, breath to take me on. He knows nothing about me, you know. It's like, yeah. you know, he's got an ego to gratify. That's good enough for him. If, it, if, if that's what his deal is. Look, I just went to do the, a favor for my teacher and I was happy to represent my teacher and uh, that's what I did. And then they they didn't even get a fighter from Leon team. They got a fighter from the other the other team to fight Jimmy. So. Yeah. Well, maybe the producer did Jimmy a favor. I don't know. A lot. It, it, it was bullshit about, you know, the Chinese fighter because the other guy that was first to go was Italian in the first place. That's who they agreed on originally. So yeah. 
Elton yeah. Ting was furious. Uh, and they said, you're going to stay for the fight to watch the fight? I said, no, fuck that. I'm going out. So I went in town. Yeah. I didn't stay to watch the fight. I got nothing against Jimmy, by the way. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, what's your favorite martial arts movie? Uh, it has to be Into the Dragon. Always will be. Bruce Lee. Good one. That's a good movie. Uh, let me add. Second best, Fearless with Jet Li. So let's say you were in a back alley and uh, you got 10 guys facing you. Um, you have to pick one martial arts actor or actor in general to back you up. Who would that be? One. One. Ah, oh, shit. Well, let, let's say two. Let's say two. Let's make it interesting. <laughs> well, because, because I've worked with him, definitely Steven Seagal. Yeah. One. Next one, shit. Who would I have? Uh, people are going to shit cam me on this one. I wouldn't mind having Michael J. White. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. <laughs> just, just so he can bloody land some good kicks in. Just to watch him kick everyone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's a good kicker. Um, yeah, I mean, Seagal and Michael J. White. That's a good choice. So, what do you think of Jackie Chan? Uh, Jackie Chan, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd probably crack up laughing before he start hitting people. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of Steven Seagal, uh, you got to work with him and uh, uh, train with him. How was that experience? Oh, well, you know, well, you know, I mean, it was thanks to you and Letizia that I got there. So, I mean, mainly because of you know, your your input that uh, I got there. So, I mean, I wish I could do it again, honestly. I, I liked it. It was a positive experience. It's a shame what's happening with Russia, though. Um, yeah. The experience itself um, it was excellent. I was surprised to see the type of people that rocked up because there were different levels, different, you know, levels of or standards of people from, you know, military backgrounds, um, even martial arts backgrounds. Like there was uh, Ale Ale Alexandro Emilyankov. Yep. You know, his brother, he was there and uh, that was pretty impressive. And a lot of the arm holds and uh, the arm bars that he would do, a lot of the stuff that he would actually do to you was pretty impressive. There was a lot there. There was a lot there that he did. That you don't see, you know, that you don't see in films and stuff like that. A lot of stuff behind the scenes. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> His uh, ukanagashi is uh, sometimes somewhat similar of a bong sao. Um, yeah. And um, he, he does a little bit of Wing Chun also with some of the deflections and, and the blocks. Um, yeah, so. Similarities there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm not wrong. He, he does a bit, some stuff with Samuel Kwok, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, yeah. Which, yeah. Is, which is pretty cool. Yeah. But I think they do an exchange or something. I think so. Um, so what is your main focus nowadays? Well, nowadays, uh, I'm more concentrated in, in teaching and, uh, teaching some guys that do security. I do a lot less security work. I'll do something if they call me like something specific, um, you know, maybe too hard to do jobs. I like that sort of stuff, you know, <laughs> at least it keeps me interested. But, um, or else I, I teach security guys, I teach just yes, regular people, and then I travel to my schools in, in other parts of the Europe. That's what I like doing. Plus I build up a new studio under my house and uh, I just keep it personal. Awesome. How do you prepare for peace by training in combat arts and training for fighting and for uh, war? 
when I prepare for battle, you know, one-on-one, one-on-two, one-on-three, one-on-five, yeah, I mean, I have a particular programs of how I prepare myself and prepare guys. And, uh, and then how I avoid it, because I do, I usually avoid it. But deep inside, when the moment comes, I still try and avoid it, but I'm a ticking time bomb underneath till the moment comes. Yep. I usually don't let anybody know what I know until they actually get close to me. The moment yep. they're close to me, that's when I let everything loose. Yeah. Yeah, but I, uh, I try not to give anything away. Yeah. Or like, like the quote goes, it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. And I find that uh, peaceful men uh, usually are the most capable of doing violence. Uh, without being capable of doing violence, you tend to be harmless or passive. And that doesn't necessarily make you peaceful. It makes you incapable of regulating for peace. Yeah. Um, so um, what, what is your thoughts on the world today and the, the, the future for the world and the, the way things are going? Well, first of all, as far as the gardener is concerned, in a war, he could, a couple of days before, fill the fields with poison ivy. Think of that one. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, other poisonous plants, if, he, if he's a good art expert. Anyway, what can I say? I'm hoping that, that we're coming out of this pandemic that maybe things you know will pick th pick up. I'm hoping. I just think that a lot of the times um, when I teach, because I live out in the country, you know, that everybody put down their phones and we go work outside and work with the trees, with the nature, and we just get them get them away from the phones. Yeah. Very connected to the country out here. So what is your best advice on training for self-defense, mentally and physically? Well, you know, if, if they want quick results for self-defense, we usually teach a um, few techniques, which teach uh, counter-attacking um, techniques, counter-attacking techniques. And we go with four principles. And basically, it's to counterattack straight away. As soon as you close the distance, you have to protect yourself, your center, right? Be with your legs and your arms, right? Now, I'm not talking about knife defense and stuff like that. I'm just talking against fists and legs. You step in quickly to close the distance, but with your guard, you have to protect yourself as best as possible. You close the distance to attack his body. This is what I teach my guys. And you close in to attack his center, his body, not so much his arms. Attack his center and go straight in for his face, right? Straight in for his face, close the distance as fast as you can and keep pressing and attacking him, all the center points. Be it with the legs, be it with your knees, be it with the elbows, just keep smashing and smashing, smashing until you finish as quickly as possible. That stepping in, because reaction is, is much quicker than his action, right? Like, yeah. a lot of people think, if I do the defense first and then counterattack, it's too late. Yeah. Because most yeah. people will always think that, you know, think, okay, if I wait and do it in the defense and do an attack, but if I, if I cover myself and do a counterattack, right, especially with this type of defense that I'm doing now, that usually protects me, not close the distance. And I zoom right into his center. Just that on itself has always helped me on the street, especially in security work, because it's the last thing they expect. Yeah, that's good advice. It's it sounds strange because when you talk about it on 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 the screen, you know people say ah, that doesn't look good. But yeah, when you when you try it on one on one, it's it's completely different. Uh, what would you say is, is is your Wing Chun and what makes your Wing Chun maybe, I don't know, different than others? 
Would you say that? I'd like to think that my Wing Chun is uh, the culmination of probably three lineages that I followed. Um, so they, they follow that pattern of, of the three lineages. So it could all combine. Maybe there's a bit of my own input for sure, for sure. Um, I think what makes it different, I think what makes it different is the fact that I, I always have this reality approach to it. You know, it's like, I don't like living in fantasy land. I, you know, it's like, for me, I look at a technique, not for the sake of just looking at a technique and I say, oh, that's nice. And so that's a nice form or that's a nice technique. Uh, yeah, to me, it's got to be functional for combat. And I've always had that approach, right? That's probably what makes me, dip, makes me different. But I think that most people that look at combat seriously, um, one guy that comes to mind in particular is Alan Orr. He's, he's a guy who, who trains fighters um, you know, for the ring. I think he's, he's in New Zealand, right? And, you know, he probably takes the same attitude. Uh, there's other couple of guys like that as well. You know, and plus I've been doing it just over 50 years. So, you know, definitely boxing has been a bit of an input, input for me. That definitely helps as well. I've got um, two times uh, world champion uh, Tim Witherspoon. He's sort of like collaborating with my channel because he, he likes how I do techniques. So he, he sees that I've I've got this boxing input within my with my within my structure, and I told him, yeah, that's because I've been sort of like cross training with boxing for so many years. So it could be for that reason as well. So I have this instinct of attacking anyway, and plus. You know, in Wing Chun, they teach you that in reality, every technique that you do has this duality, which is to absorb and to attack. So every technique that you do is not only a defense, it's an attack anyway. And so I, I have this tendency that when I'm, when I'm chi saying with you, I, I'm ready to attack you instinctively. So that's yeah. probably why. That, that could possibly be the reason. Sifu Fernandez, uh, thank you very much for coming on. It's been my pleasure and honor. It's been great. And uh, thank you for taking the time. You're welcome, mate. It was good to see you too, mate. Really good. Hope to see you soon. Thanks. Ciao, mate. Ciao.